on the three-year anniversary since the liberation of Afghanistan, I am currently on my first visit to the newly formed Islamic Emirate to understand what has been the biggest challenges and achievements in the last three years. I am honoured to have with me today the spokesperson for the Foreign Ministry of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, and that is none other than Mr. Abdul Qahar Balki. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let me start by asking you what has been the biggest achievement in the last three years. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmanuhu wa nasallahu ala rasulihil kareem. So the achievements by the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan are many. Uh, but if I was to uh, briefly put it, the greatest achievement of the Islamic Emirate is attaining our freedom and independence from a very brutal foreign occupation uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, the second is the establishment of the Islamic system. Uh, and the third is maintaining the unity uh, of the country itself and the people, bringing their hearts closer together. The amnesty that was provided uh, to all Afghans that worked and collaborated with the foreign occupiers uh, in order to bring about a period of healing amongst the Afghans uh, and bringing the hearts closer together with one another. In terms of the policy of general amnesty uh, for those who were part of the previous regime, uh, some have said that, well, this is a way in which to get us back into the country to then either prosecute us, to jail us or to torture us. Is there any merit to that claim? Uh, no, absolutely. There hasn't been any incident where uh, the Islamic Emirate uh, has given any individual amnesty and then the individual has gone on to be persecuted uh, or any, of, uh, any such incident uh, ever recorded over the course of three years. Uh, so that's just fear-mongering by perhaps some individuals and circles to uh, divide the Afghans and then use that division uh, for uh, nefarious purposes. Have you had people come back from the previous regime and resettled? And There's been a lot of people. We have set up a, a committee that is uh, headed by the Deputy Prime Minister for Political Affairs, uh, Mawli Kabir, and they, um, according to... The information that I have, more than 700 individuals have returned back, um, senior individuals uh, from the previous administration that have returned back and resettled in Afghanistan. Do these individuals have any hope or scope to be part of the Islamic Emirate government? Uh, Can they be trusted? So these individuals, uh, previously the situation in Afghanistan over the course of the many years has been that Afghanistan has been the home of officials, government officials, and no one else. These individuals uh, that have returned back, and generally all the Afghans living abroad uh, that have uh, become refugees or displaced over the course of the nearly uh, half a century of war and conflict, they're all allowed to return back and contribute uh, to the prosperity uh, peace and stability of their countries. What has been the biggest challenges in the last three years? The biggest challenge um, that we're dealing with uh, is the devastation that was brought upon Afghanistan in terms of the destruction of infrastructure and also the loss of life. Uh, for us to help and assist the martyrs, the disabled, the orphans, uh, the drug addicts, uh, close to three and a half million, four million people. Um, and also to uh, reverse the uh, adverse impacts and perversions culturally, ideologically, that was promoted uh, by the foreign occupiers for their own purposes. Um, so that is one of the greatest challenges that the Islamic Emirate uh, has dealt with and continues uh, to deal with. So talking about the U.S. occupiers, the American occupiers, um, they have frozen $9.5 billion of uh, Afghanistan's uh, assets. They claim, or they've argued, the basis of that is a lawsuit uh, for the um, family members of the victims of 9-11 that mm -hmm. funds from this $9.5 billion would be allocated for them. Um, does the Islamic Emirate have any expectations or hope to see any of those assets being unfrozen? Because I'm sure that has significantly contributed towards, you know, slowing down the speed of progress and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
so of course when great powers uh, they do not achieve the goals that they set out in their uh, unjust wars they uh, resort to uh, to petty things and petty issues uh, and one of those is the Americans justifying their actions uh, which directly and adversely impacts the people of Afghanistan, the recovery and rehabilitation uh, of Afghanistan as a people and as a country uh, by um, justifying these actions uh, through uh, excuses such as litigations, lawsuits and, uh, uh, and other excuses that they make. Uh, but our position is that this is the, uh, these are the assets of the state of Afghanistan not the government of Afghanistan, and the assets of the people of Afghanistan uh, that are used by the central bank uh, for uh, their own functionality uh, and for the uh, progress of this country. And uh, we uh, do not see it, uh, we see it as the right of the people of Afghanistan for these assets to be returned back without any conditions. Now, some of our viewers and listeners who may not be privy to how these technicalities work they may be wondering, well, if she kicked the Americans out and the country is liberated, how is it that nine and a half billion worth of assets have been frozen by them? What are these assets? Where are they? Mm -hmm. And why does the Americans have access to it and control it? Mm -hmm. So every single country has a central bank, uh, and the central bank has assets in New York, ah. uh, and they utilize the SWIFT system uh, for transaction purposes. Okay. So when banks uh, exchange money, and interact with one another, they do it through New York. Okay. And that is the system uh, that has been um, adopted by all world countries uh, after World War II. Uh, and that's why the United States has such domination when it comes to uh, foreign reserves, such as you know, the USD being used as the uh, reserve currency by every country. Unfortunately, they have uh, misused their power uh, over the course of decades in terms of sanctions uh, on, on countries such as Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea, Iran, and others uh, that the United States deems as their uh, adversary. Uh, and the world powers are now looking into creating an alternative system uh, away from the monopoly that the United States of America has. So Afghanistan was in a similar case. The central bank assets were in New York, uh, and the Americans have unjustly uh, frozen those assets. When you refer to their an alternative system, were you referring to BRICS or something like BRICS? Mm. Yeah, the, the, one of the stated aims of BRICS uh, is to move away from the financial system that uh, was created uh, and agreed upon by all world powers after World War II. Mm. Uh, and now that they've seen uh, that the United States misuses um, that trust placed in them, they have decided that they would like to create an alternative financial system uh, to uh, allow countries to function and interact with one another without the monopoly of the United States of America. I'm assuming that IEA supports or would favor such an alternative system as a balance and check to U.S. hegemony? Uh, obviously, we've suffered uh, terribly from such injustices. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, even in, in the private sector, competition is something that spurs growth. Um, so if we have uh, alternatives for countries to interact with one another, why not? Sure. I think it should be welcomed by the United States as well. As I understand, the schools are open for girls up to class six, mm -hmm. which is around 11, 12 years old. It seems to be an, a contentious issue even for supporters of the Islamic Emirate, people mm -hmm. who love the administration, support the administration, are ideologically aligned, don't need convincing otherwise that even amongst them, mm. for my interaction, this seems to be an issue. Are we expected to see any reforms or changes mm. to this policy? Indeed, this is, uh, as you rightly put it, one of the uh, issues that affects Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, governments make policies, they change policies, uh, laws and regulations uh, as they deem fit uh, for the time, place and situation that they're in. Uh, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan has currently chosen the uh, approach of opening uh, all schools for girls until grade six, uh, while closing uh, from seventh grade and beyond. Uh, this is the schooling system, 
But overall, uh, the narrative that the Islamic Emirate is against the education of women uh, is incorrect. Um, it is malicious uh, attempt to tarnish the image uh, of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Um, they have opened other avenues, whether it's through madrasas, homeschooling, online schooling, other avenues. Um, as for uh, what the challenges are in terms of reopening these schools, uh, it's not only limited to logistics, finances, budget, but there's a range of other issues uh, that when uh, the relevant ministries uh, can uh, find a solution to, inshallah, uh, there will be a resolution uh, to the entire situation as deemed fit uh, and appropriate for Afghanistan. Do you feel this issue has been weaponized by Western states and NGOs and think tanks and policy makers? Definitely. I mean, uh, there's no doubt that states use uh, issues, uh, especially domestic affairs of a country, as tools to punish and justify uh, those punishments and aggressions. And this is one of the, the tools in the hands uh, of those that have lost uh, a war that, uh, you know, the resources, the blood, the treasure that they put into the goal that they wanted to achieve and, and they failed in doing so uh, to justify what they're doing in terms of freezing assets and punishing the people of Afghanistan, collective punishment. Um, indeed, this is a tool that they use uh, and they push this narrative out, which unfortunately has also uh, negatively affected, like you rightly said, some of the uh, Muslim communities mm -hmm. abroad that uh, also believe that maybe the, the, the Islamic Emirate is against the education of women and they've fallen for their trap uh, when the situation is uh, actually opposite. The, if you look at the even numbers published by the World Bank, access to education for women and girls has actually increased uh, across Afghanistan. So that itself uh, is a demonstration that we uh, remain committed uh, to providing uh, all the opportunities for both uh, men and women of Afghanistan. What would your comments be to Muslims, well-meaning Muslims, um, who have no malicious intent, but clearly take this issue quite personally, for whatever reasons. It could be cultural, it could be the way many have been raised in the West, it could be other Muslim-majority nations who have a different approach uh, to education and employment when it comes to women and girls. Um, How's it been? I mean, what would your comments be to them who, who are not coming from an ideological perspective, mm -hmm. who are not coming from uh, a partisan point of view? Uh, one example would be, and it's been a while, but there was a letter from Mufti Taqi Usmani, the prominent mm -hmm. scholar of Pakistan, mm -hmm. who I believe wrote a letter. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of vibe. What would, your, what would your comments be to those Muslims mm -hmm. who also see it as a concern? Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of Muslim scholars uh, come to Afghanistan to discuss this issue uh, on the schools and universities. Uh, like you rightly pointed out, uh, Mufti uh, Taqi Usmani uh, has also written a letter. And if you read the letter, he says, this issue is being used as a political tool. Uh, he does not state that this is something, uh, you know, that is affecting us uh, or affecting Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. He says that they're using this as a tool and, and the government, his recommendation and suggestion is that it finds a way on reopening uh, and unlocking uh, this issue. But generally speaking, you know, states, whichever state it may be, uh, they adopt laws and regulations in line with their own uh, cultural and religious practices. Orf. Um, orf. Uh, and Afghanistan at this stage... Uh, after a half a century of um, ideological war that was waged against our people, has chosen that at this moment and stage, this is how we're going to approach this issue. And we'll see what happens in the future. How's the current relationship between, uh, obviously, the largest ethnic group, which is the Pashtuns, and the second larger group, uh, the Tajiks, who are somewhere in the north, if I got my geography correct, are things cool? Do you, do you have Tajik members of the Islamic Emirates, Mujahideen, fighters, or government officials from that group? So this narrative, again, uh, again is one of those uh, ideological battles that 
that I refer to is uh, to is, is by Western countries, by Orientalists. They were called formerly Orientalists to try to divide uh, the Muslims mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. Alhamdulillah, if you travel across the country, you'll see marriages, you'll see relationships, you'll see you know living um, co peaceful coexistence between the Pashtuns, Tajiks, Uzbeks, Turkmens. So there really isn't any such um, tensions between the different ethnicities. Afghanistan is one of the most diverse uh, geography, ethnically speaking, in this entire region. So if you look at Afghanistan, you'll have Arabs, Baloch, Pashtun, Tajik, Hazara, Uzbek, Turkmen, Pashai, uh, Kyrgyz, Kazakh, Uyghurs, all these different ethnicities, they have coexisted and lived together in peace and harmony for millennia. There's no such tensions. Uh, and uh, coming to whether they have uh, positions uh, in the Islamic Emirate, uh, if you look at the developments of uh, August 15, uh, 2021, one of the first provinces uh, that fell in the hands of the forces of the Islamic Emirate was Badakhshan. Yes. And it is majority Tajik ethnicity. Uh, we have ministers, we have cabinet members, we have deputy ministers, we have commanders that are from uh, different provinces of Afghanistan and ethnically Tajik, Uzbek, Turkmen, uh, Baluch, Nuristanis. So there, no such thing actually exists in Afghanistan. So talking about the ideological weaponization of Western states and, and, the, and the media propaganda, uh, how important is the recognition the official recognition of Western states and governments uh, of the Islamic Emirate, mm. how, how significant is it in terms of accessing trade and exports and imports? Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously uh, interactions between states uh, and the global village that we live in uh, is important, uh, some more important than others. For example, for Afghanistan, uh, it is more uh, significant to have good relations with our neighbors because all of us are directly impacted by what happens uh, in our homes uh, and in our states. Uh, in terms of the Western countries, again, I'm going to point out that they lost uh, a very long war. Uh, they lost the resources, the blood and treasure they put into Afghanistan to attain their goals. So obviously, it's going to take some time uh, for them uh, to recover from such, uh, uh, from such a loss, and it will take some time for them to come back uh, and officially recognize. But recognition generally, uh, you are Mr. Hussain. You are Mr. Hussain, whether I recognize you as Mr. Hussain or I call you by some other name. I am, we are the Islamic Emirate. Uh, we rule this country, we serve our people, and we engage with foreign countries, including Western countries, uh, in private sector, in diplomatic relations, and all the other aspects uh, of state-to-state -state relations that we have. Again, for our viewers and listeners who may have assumed that a nation not recognizing another nation means that there's no trade or conversations, mm -hmm. does that mean Western diplomats have been in and out of this country since August the 15th? Does yes, I mean, uh, just recently, last week, we had the uh, UK charge uh, come to Afghanistan, meet with the ministers, talk about climate change, health, and other areas uh, where we can find common interests with one another and work on those issues um, that are of uh, mutual interest to both parties. Um, states are usually uh, not issues that are recognized. Governments, there, there's a difference of opinion in international law, uh, and I'm by no means an expert on international law, uh, but there's two views. One is we recognize states, the other is we recognize governments. Mm -hmm. So state of Afghanistan is recognized by all, is actually one of the founding members of the United Nations. Uh, it's the governments. Some, gov some governments have the policy that they recognize governments. Others have a policy that they recognize states and they interact with them. Yep. Even in, according to uh, Vienna Conventions on uh, Consular Affairs, they say, you know, the consular services provided to nationals of different countries is uh, apolitical and every state has a right, uh, regardless of political recognition of the government, to provide consular services to their nationals, even in, during times of war. Uh, so the perception that perhaps unless you have some official declaration that I recognize you as a government and only then can trade 
and other engagements take place is uh, misplaced. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I think that perception needs to change. Our line of communication is open with the Americans. Yes. And um, our subjects like prisoner swaps and exchanges like the recent one we saw with uh, Russia, um, are such conversations taking place? Because of course they are uh, members of the Islamic Emirates mm -hmm. uh, that are being uh, held uh, in U.S. detention. And I know there's Americans that mm -hmm. are being held here. Um, are these conversations taking place? Of course, it's not just uh, issues related to consular services, whether it's prisoners, whether it's uh, uh, other nationals that need services. Um, so a lot of other issues that we also discuss with one another. Uh, they're usually behind closed doors. But generally speaking, yes, uh, the interactions are there. Uh, the exchanges take place. Uh, and there is a lot of movement um, because to, for us, it's important to have relations uh, with all different countries of the world. And the United States, uh, being one of the major powers, is uh, a country that we have open lines of communication and uh, engagement with. Is our sister, Dr. Afia Siddiqui, one of individuals on the agenda or in discussion point, someone to be considered for release or exchange? So again, uh, the exchanges and conversations that we have are more behind closed doors. <laughs> uh, and that's where we would like to keep them. Back to consulates and embassies, right? So people who are trying to get visas to come here, um, there are some consulates and embassies that are not functioning mm -hmm. uh, because of recognition, not recognition, arguments to do with legitimacy, mm -hmm. illegitimacy, and all that kind of stuff. When will those issues be resolved, especially for diaspora communities that want to visit here, mm -hmm. but they're having to jump through hoops and holes to um, get visas? Uh, so one aspect of this is that governments and states don't actually have embassies and consulate generals in every single state of the world. Uh, some might who have the resources uh, to send diplomats and, uh, and provide those services in every single country of the world. Uh, Afghanistan is one of those that uh, doesn't have it uh, in every single country. In Europe, specifically, we have five embassies uh, and a consulate general that works with and coordinates with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They provide visas, passports, uh, deeds, NOCs, whatever is needed. Uh, we have embassies and consulates in Dubai, in Qatar, in Turkey, regional countries, in Malaysia, Indonesia, which are providing services to anyone that uh, approaches them, whether it's Afghan or a foreign national that seeks visas or other services. Talking about neighbors now, because you mentioned wanting good relations with neighbors uh, in terms of prosperity and stability uh, for, that, for the Islamic Emirates. Let's, let me ask you about Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Uh, a nation which has a deep and long and even intimate relationship with Afghanistan. There's been tensions. Um, some of it, for sure, has been over-amplified for political reasons. Others are undeniable. Um, you see it after the cricket matches. Mm -hmm. You see it on social media. Uh, Pakistanis and Afghans accusing each other of all sorts. Mm -hmm. What is the relationship between the Islamic Emirates and Pakistan as we speak? Mm -hmm. Is it a brotherly one? Is it a good one? Is it a positive one? In light of reports of border clashes and things like this? Uh, it is, again, uh, one of the challenges that the Islamic Emirate faces is reversing uh, the adverse effects uh, of the ideological war that was waged in Afghanistan for foreign purposes. Uh, not, for, not in the interest of Afghanistan and not in the interest of the people of Afghanistan. And one of those unfortunate uh, issues is this tension uh, that exists between uh, whether it was the former communist, uh, whether it's uh, the, the administration of Ashraf Ghani and Karzai. They promoted this, this narrative that Afghanistan and Pakistan always need to be in opposition camps and, and uh, sowed the seed of hate, hatred towards one another. And the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan believes that the people of Pakistan and Afghanistan are same blood, same flesh, same bone. We have a religion that bonds uh, one another. 
uh, and in our religion, we are labeled as brothers, and we see the people of Pakistan as our brothers. We have long uh, historic uh, relations between these people. They're, they're basically one people, one culture, one language, uh, one religion, and a lot of other commonalities. It's not only just with Pakistan. It's also so with Uzbekistan, with Turkmenistan, with Iran, with Kazakhstan, and like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different ethnicities in Pakistan. Our cultures, they mix. Our religion is one. Even our jurisprudence, we, we all adhere to the Hanafi fiqh. Uh, so it's one people. Uh, these um, unfortunate clashes that do take place uh, on these crossing points or in other uh, points of this geography, um, they are unfortunate. They are usually out of misunderstandings. But uh, as you might have observed, they are resolved immediately after such incidents happen. So we view Pakistan and all our neighbors as our own flesh and blood, and we seek uh, positive and brotherly relations uh, with all these states. What is the relationship between the Islamic Emirate and Tahrik Taliban Pakistan, so the Pakistani Taliban? Mm -hmm. um, what is the relationship? Is there a relationship? Because one of the claims um, amongst Pakistani nationalists, amongst Western propagandists, is that what's actually happening, a claim that's been made, what's actually happening is that TTP are being hosted and possibly trained here to launch attacks against the military in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, is there any truth to this or merit to these claims? So the TTP... Uh, which is the people of Pakistan who are unhappy with the policies of the state of Pakistan. Uh, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, created in the year 2004 yes. after the incident in Lal Masjid yes. where these uh, diverse uh, groups in the tribal areas of uh, Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, they came together and formed uh, the TTP. This issue uh, has been an issue that has affected Pakistan since the year 2001 when they supported the invasion of Afghanistan and stood by the side of the Americans and the people of Pakistan, uh, especially uh, those in the uh, northwest frontier province, uh, Balochistan and other, uh, and other places, they were unhappy with their policy and they reacted to their policy, especially when the military, the Pakistani military entered uh, these areas uh, and conducted military operations, which uh, obviously... Uh, uh, it develops enmity and hatred uh, towards one another. So it's a lingering issue for Pakistan. Uh, it has nothing to do uh, with Afghanistan. Um, there will always, obviously people try to shift responsibility, uh, their own responsibilities on others, uh, but we've maintained that our policy uh, is not allowing the territory of Afghanistan to be used against anyone. Uh, and that is a policy that we stick to. There might be claims and allegations uh, by, by different countries, but again, it's always uh, shifting of responsibility and, and uh, the blame game that they have to play to convince their own constituency and their own populations that it's not actually an issue with us. It's something that is from outside. What would you advise... Afghans and Pakistani, especially in the diaspora, because that's where they exist as communities, that's where they live alongside each other, in, a, in lands which are not Muslim lands, um, host nations are Europeans, sure, we might be second, third generation, but we live side by side and tensions are there. What would your advice be to both Afghans and Pakistanis to mutually improve mm -hmm. uh, brotherhood and relationship? What is your advice? Our, our advice, uh, not only to the Pakistanis and Afghans, but to the Muslim communities generally uh, living abroad uh, in uh, non-Muslim majority countries, is at the end of the day, we're Muslims. We are bonded by the word of God, of Allah, that we believe in. And the Quran specifically says that Muslims are but brothers to one another. That should be the basis of our interactions, not Pakistan or not Afghanistan. These are only recent concepts uh, of the Westphalian system that then came to uh, this part of the world. And that is not something that should divide us. Rather, it should be something uh, just as language, as culture, as necessity, as only for identification purposes to understand who you're speaking with. Um, it should not be a point of division. Rather, it should be something 
they should be used to strengthen uh, bonds with one another on the basis of the Islamic injunction of brotherhood. On the subject of brotherhood, there's also been recent developments in Bangladesh, uh, whereby earlier on this month, um, Sheikh Hasina uh, resigned and fled the country to India. She had ruled the nation with a, a, a iron fist for 15 years and for popular protests from the students, uh, managed to pressure the, her to resign and flee the country. Uh, amongst the protests, we saw the white flag of the Kalima. Mm -hmm. Not once, not twice, but there were many instances. And even in one picture, they had raised this very flag above the Bangladesh flag. There are some within the student protest movement that would like to see a more Islamic or overtly Islamic Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? I know the Islamic Emirate has not taken a stance. Mm -hmm. You've not commented on this. But mm -hmm. what are your general thoughts uh, mm -hmm. on those sentiments of the Bangladeshi student protests? Mm -hmm. So there's two aspects to it. Uh, one is the stepping down of Sheikh Hasina, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. I think it was uh, good that she took that approach because the demonstrations uh, were uh, developing uh, a pattern where violence was used to suppress the people. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, reported deaths of, of children, of women, uh, and of families. Uh, so it was good to see that it did not break out into all an all-out war and violence and conflict. Because from our experiences, when situation develops in that direction, it's extremely difficult to bring people back together uh, and realize stability uh, and peace. So it was good that the will of uh, the people uh, was accepted by uh, the prime minister. And she left her office and allowed for a peaceful transition, um, which um, acquiesced the popular will of the people. Uh, with regards to the kalima, uh, the white flag or the black flag or, or the green flag, which has the kalima, the kalima is the uh, first pillar of Islam. Um, it, it's a flag, uh, the kalima, used on different colors, used throughout uh, many uh, Islamic uh, governances and rules and history. And Bangladesh, being a country that was created on the principle of uh, a Muslim majority country and for Islam, for Muslims to be protected and have the freedom to practice their religion and their beliefs. Uh, if the people deem that they should have a certain type of government where, like you said, more overt Islamically, uh, I think it should be respected and, and it's their uh, due right uh, on whatever type of government that they would like to form. On the subject of brotherhood, remaining on it, and also because you mentioned that Uyghurs had lived in Afghanistan. Um, of course, uh, many are aware of the reports of the persecution of Uyghur Muslims in China, uh, whether that be suppression and censorship of religious practices in the public place, whether it be the re-education centers. Um, of course, the numbers are debated, but it exists. Um, what are your thoughts uh, on this issue? And is there any kind of back-end conversation that's taken place with China uh, with regards to the Uyghurs? We, we've, uh, just as you've read reports, we've also read reports uh, not only about the Uyghurs, but also the Rohingya and the other Muslim uh, minorities that live in different states across the world. Uh, we believe that uh, all Muslims, whether majority or minority, uh, be allowed uh, a chance to practice their religion uh, in complete freedom um, and should be prevented uh, and not prosecuted or discriminated, discriminated against based on their religion. Whether it's in uh, the, the Uyghurs, whether it's in the Central African Republic, even in Syria and other places, uh, we are against the persecution of our uh, Muslim brothers and sisters. We stand in solidarity with them and we support uh, their cause wherever may... It may be uh, their right to freedom, their right to prosperity, and their right to practice their religion in complete openness and in complete freedom. How crucial and vital is Chinese investments for the prosperity of Afghanistan? 
Investment uh, and interactions on the economic side are vital for Afghanistan, uh, whether it's with China or anyone else, um, but China being one of the major powers uh, internationally and being our next door neighbor, uh, we welcome the investment uh, and economic exchanges that we have with China for the rehabilitation uh, of the uh, state of Afghanistan, uh, its infrastructure, capacity building, and other areas. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, we have not limited ourselves to China. Uh, we believe uh, in a foreign policy that is balanced, that is economic-centric, and that is open. Um, we welcome the Russians, the Iranians, the Americans, the Europeans, anyone uh, that has mutual interests and shows mutual respect uh, and with whom we can find common interests in Afghanistan. We welcome uh, such exchanges. And uh, one of our stated goals is to turn Afghanistan into a hub of trade and transit for this region uh, and to revive the old uh, Silk Road. Bring the interview to a close. What, have, what has been the challenges of the Islamic Emirate considering you've been fighting an occupation for 20 years and you've kind of been catapulted into being statesmen? How has that been for those who are foot soldiers and mujahideen and resistance fighters that all now find themselves as state runners and people who have got a completely shift uh, in priorities and job roles. Mm -hmm. How has that been? It's been a very easy transition because the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, uh, when it was launched as a movement, as the movement uh, of the Taliban or the uh, students of knowledge, Islamic knowledge, uh, it was a grassroots movement. Uh, it was not something that uh, was parachuted into Afghanistan uh, like some other individuals. Uh, it had popular support. It was based and supported by uh, former uh, government officials, people that were experts. Uh, they had key positions, uh, and they ruled Afghanistan for five years in their first uh, time when they came to power. So they had that experience as well. And then uh, we had the brutal occupation. Uh, the roles shifted, but at the same time, the structure was there, whether it was in cultural affairs, military affairs, economic affairs. All of these commissions, uh, or what they labeled as shadow governments, existed. So the transition was very smooth, uh, and the capacities were retained. And with the amnesty, uh, we managed to retain and stop the brain drain uh, of Afghanistan, which was one of the goals of uh, the evacuations, as they like to call it, uh, under the garb of protecting the lives uh, of these individuals. Uh, and following the uh, amnesty to encourage Afghans to return back with their expertise in politics, in diplomacy, uh, in, in uh, economy, in science, to encourage them to return back to Afghanistan and contribute to the rehabilitation uh, and advancement uh, of their country. Uh, so it was a, a seamless uh, transition. Uh, and alhamdulillah, uh, we are so far doing well. The Ummah's eyes has been locked onto Gaza, the ongoing genocide in Gaza, uh, inflicted by the Israeli occupiers. Um, the official death toll is over 40,000, but realistically, it can be beyond 100,000 if you look at those who are still missing under rubble, those with near-death injuries and will probably die as a result of sustaining those injuries. There was a recent attack uh, during Salat al-Fajr uh, where more than 200 people were killed. People said we couldn't even find a single body intact. It's been a harrowing 10 months. And not just the bloodshed and, 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 and the sheer barbar barbarity of it, but also the hypocrisy of those who claim to uphold international law and things like this. What is the general mood of the leadership of the Islamic Emirate? Because I've spoken to the, the every ordinary people of Afghanistan, and subhanAllah, considering many have very little, their hearts and minds are with their brothers in Gaza and occupied Palestine. The very fact that you go to Wazir Akbar Khan Hill mm -hmm. next to the big flag is a replica of the Dome of the Rock. So it's very visible exactly where the heart of mind is. But what's the mood of the leadership of the Islamic Emirate with regards to genocide in Gaza? Our position on this issue has been uh, very clear 
um, we condemn the occupation. We believe even under uh, the so-called international law, which is now under the rubble of Gaza, um, uh, that it is the right of the Palestinians to resist an occupation and a colonization of their lands. Not just in Gaza, but also the atrocities uh, that have taken place in the West Bank and continue to take place uh, with, uh, at the hands, uh, with, with the support and complicity of the so-called uh, champions of human rights and international law. Uh, it is uh, a demonstration, uh, like you rightly put it, the sheer hypocrisy and duplicity of these uh, so-called Western powers that purportedly uphold uh, human rights uh, and champion human rights across the globe. It is a clear demonstration uh, to the Islamic world uh, that these slogans uh, do not hold any weight and it is up to the Islamic world to take care of their own affairs through unity, through coming together and through taking concrete steps to prevent uh, this genocide that is taking place. Uh, and uh, it is a wake-up call for everyone to really look deep uh, and reassess their positions. Uh, and the Islamic Emirate will always stand in solidarity and support the legal struggle and resistance of the people of Palestine. Uh, to defend and to uh, struggle against this colonization and occupation. On the issue of Muslims coming together and unifying and, um, you know, self-reflecting and digging deep with regards to the future of the Muslim-majority world, the ideas, the ideology, the values of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, is this a project that is strictly for Afghanistan? Or are there hopes and aspirations that other Muslim nations would consider a similar model, um, not in terms of how it's practically implemented, but in terms of being more overt about the Islamic identity of said state, mm -hmm. um, looking to implement what they deem, according to their orf, um, an Islamic system? Or is it something which, for now, or conclusively, is just for Afghanistan? So one thing that I want to clarify is that the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is not a project. It is the manifestation of the will and of the struggle of the people of Afghanistan for the establishment of an Islamic system and for them to uh, determine their own destiny without any foreign interference and without any foreign influence. And it is uh, praiseworthy if we look uh, at the state of affairs, the countries that have taken their destiny into their own hands have prospered and have become great powers and contributed greatly to humanity uh, and to world affairs. And it is up to the Islamic world uh, to pursue uh, and determine the pathway forward um, on how they would like to very overtly, because it is their right, they're Muslims at the end of the day, uh, how they would like to approach uh, taking back their freedom and their sovereignty and their destiny into their own hands, away from all the noise uh, and all the demands of uh, certain uh, former colonial powers on what the best system for a country or a state should be. It should be the people of these countries that actually decide. Uh, and Afghanistan, uh, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, to come back to the point, is the manifestation of that will uh, of the people of Afghanistan. My final question to you, Mr. Boki. Prosper Afghanistan, a UK-based organization, facilitated and helped uh, my current trip to the Islamic Emirate and, you know, meetings and, and so forth. Um, what concluding comments or advice would you give to Muslims living in the West in how they can aid help, assist, reconnect with the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan? Uh, so our advice and recommendation to the Muslims uh, of living uh, in the Western countries 
uh, whether they're Afghan diaspora, whether it's, it's the general Muslims, uh, would be one to preserve and promote their culture and identity, to not lose uh, what they have. Because at the end of the day, that is one of the most important defining characteristics uh, of a human being, uh, to promote and preserve their culture and identity. And second, to reconnect with their countries, not just necessarily Afghanistan, their own countries, to reconnect back with their roots, to impart and share the knowledge and the skills and expertise that they've gained, uh, whether it's in education, uh, in finance, in economy, whatever skill sets that they have learned, to bring that back uh, to their countries uh, and reconnect and work for the prosperity and the well-being uh, of their uh, own countries and people. I think that would be the best advice that I could give uh, so, to the, so, to the so, Muslims. So, so you're not ready for mass hijrah of European Muslims? <laughs> <laughs> <that going out>, no? <laughs> you could just shift the mass migration issue to uh, Afghanistan. Right? <laughs> Thank you so much for have, giving us your time. Jazakallah khair. That was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Brothers, sisters and friends, I hope you'll thoroughly enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. If you did, please remember to click subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel, leave a comment, like the video. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.